uh, and to give an idea of some of the things Bill did. So uh, let us get that. You guys probably didn't know it, but that was our national anthem over there for a year, rather than the Stars of Spangled Banner. So it was just uh, a different place. Uh, the unit that I served in was 717th Air Cav, and the assault helicopter company that you saw there has different tactics than we had. So I'm going to just talk about Air Cav tactics. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So with that, this is what, uh, the front end of a Huey. And these things right here were vetments. We had to park in those every night that kept the shells from damaging the skids. So that was very helpful. Uh, we have, uh, I have a couple of objectives today. Number one is to describe the equipment and the tactics that we have. And number two is kind of give you some hints. Uh, well, let me ask a question first. How many people have relatives or friends that were in Vietnam and don't want to talk about it? <laughs> Just put your hand down. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do, try to do is give you a little background on what to talk to people, other, uh, either aviators, or it doesn't matter. When... Uh, that was our uh, logo for the company, the 717th. We were the Ruthless Riders. One of the things you can talk about to your guys that don't want to talk to you, ask them what unit they were in. It's very easy. It's very easy to start the conversation that way. What unit were you in? Where were you at? That way, the the absolute worst question you can ask a veteran is, well, tell me about the war. You might as well ask a mechanic how to disassemble a V8 engine. So there's just too many parts of it. So ask them direct questions, and they're, everybody's really proud of their company. So I have here, I'm modeling the uh, latest CAV gear which was uh, made in Boulder, Colorado and shipped to me by my sister. And uh, you see our, uh, the aircraft here, here's a loach. And for perspective, it's about eight and a half feet. The length is about 15 feet. Here's a minigun right here. And I'll show you a little bit more of the cockpit later on. And I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Uh, we were at Campanari, which is about where the E on Pleiku is, and most of our work, we were all intelligence gathering. That's what we did. We, we looked at trail usage, we looked at bank bunkers, we looked at damage from B-52s when they'd fly over. We'd take and describe how many kills they got. And the area that we primarily worked was up here in the tri-border area with Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And after about a week, you don't even need a map. You just know where you're going to go. So when uh, we went out, we had an enlisted man. There was one pilot, one observer. The observer was an enlisted man, usually a sergeant or higher. And this is what he wore. This is his body armor here. Uh, these right here are incendiary grenades, and this right here is a smoke grenade. The reason the smoke is up here is because when you start taking fire, his job is to, it's pins are hooked on there, pull it and drop it. Then that marks where we uh, took fire at. Uh, here's the mini gun in the relaxed position, and then back here, it's kind of hard to see, but we uh, hauled 2,000 rounds, and the mini gun would shoot about 2,000 rounds a minute. Wow. No, it wasn't near fast enough. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was slow. 
Here's the, uh, for any of you aviators in here, people do civilian flying, if you'll, all these instruments are all analog. In today's cockpits, everything is digitized, it's little TV screens. And this is what we flew by and very seldom, oh, every once in a while we use the altimeter, but the rest of it we could listen and hear and that was what we, all we needed to do. Um, inside the cockpit, you have a collective, which controls your power in a vertical plane. We have a cyclic right here. You don't see a top handle, but that controls your motion in a horizontal plane. And then the foot pedals here control the tail rotor so that when you're adding torque or decreasing torque from your engine, that uh, that keeps you straight. Otherwise, you're doing, you can't control the aircraft. I didn't tell you, anytime you, anybody wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll roll in on you. No. One of the things about being a Loach pilot is there was no Loach pilot transition in the United States. And your transition was in country. This guy right here, is the reason I'm here today. This is my mentor. You did the transition in country. You learned all you need to, mostly, from guys that had been there before. So you rode with another experienced pilot for several days. And this was, this guy had been flying in country about six months when he started showing me the ropes. But it was First Lieutenant Terry Bishop, and he was, you just never forget the guys who give you that kind of skill. Now, what this is, is a 20-year-old bulletproof go-getter who wants to go out and burn down Vietnam and pave it so we can win the war. So that's what they look like. Yes, it is. It was the glasses you couldn't recognize, right? <laughs> okay, here we are going to work. We flew in formation all the time. We usually took four loaches, four gunships, and four slicks, the Hueys. These things, the scouts always led. So wherever we were going, We'd do two, three, four missions a day, and the scouts would lead out, the guns would follow. Usually the slicks or the infantry would sit on the ground and wait for us until we got into something. So that's how we went to work. Might get a little uh, appreciation of the terrain here. We had some flat and other mountainous. Uh, these aircraft, had a little Allison uh, T-63A, which are rated about 300 horsepower. You needed all that. These things, the helicopters empty, were about 1,200 pounds. But then you had the armament, and uh, that got you up to max takeoff weight of 2,700 pounds. Yes, sir. How, how many, how much time did you have in fuel and how, what was your normal radius away from uh, distance away from the base? Okay, uh, there were four, I'm sorry, two self-sealing tanks on there for a total of 61 gallons of fuel. Uh, the 61 gallons of fuel would get us out there flight range about, um, trying to look here. Sorry about that. 380 miles one way. So we had a 380 mile range. Anything else? Were those the ones that got shot at first? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our buddies. These guys would fly. Well, I mean, <clears throat> they had another minigun and most of their their stuff was rockets. 
Uh, the reason the windows are open right here is you had to be air conditioned in there. And as soon as you sat down, you opened the windows because it just got hotter than a matchstick immediately. So you open it up to get a breeze through there. The uh, front guy, who was a pilot also, was the gunner and then the pilot who controlled the rockets and everything in back. The uh, design tolerances on this for you aviator types, the center of gravity demanded you have about 100 pounds in the front seat. Otherwise, it'd just tip up and you couldn't fly it. So you non-aviator types don't appreciate that. That's... Is that a Cobra? That was a Cobra, sorry. We call them Cobras or Tanks. In fact, there's usually two names to everything. So <laughs> this is what we call the slick. And you can see a squad unit that was tra being transported out to the area of operations. And usually they would fly out first flight of the day, park at the POL area, and we'd call them in as needed. So here's one of my buddies. And these are rockets going down to, you can see the smoke right here. If you're live, you could see it. And they're dumping ordnance in there. These flew, these flew in tunes of two also. The two, they had a lead and a wing. And as soon as the lead would break off the wing, they'd come in the same spot. They would stay, they would break off far enough away that there's, they were not subject to a lot of gunfire. Here we have an insertion, and we have different smokes marking different areas because it seemed like Charlie wouldn't just get in an area and we could mark at one time and leave it alone, so we had to have different areas. Um, we usually flew on insertion. We usually flew the flanks to pick up any sort of uh, activity on the outsides. And here we are again. This is the LZ where the red smoke is. Here's the slick going in. And here are the loaches sweeping the outside of the area so the guys get out of the aircraft and find a, a safe place to go. Usually we had information as to where in the area out here we were inserted and the guys know where they're supposed to go anyway. You guys are awful quiet today. Okay, I have a question. Okay. okay. So on that slide prior to that, um, smoke, okay. So was that strictly smoke or was there some like tear gas or something in that? Where there was no, this is just to mark the area. And remember those little canisters? Mm -hmm. Throw one of them down so there wasn't anything to hurt anybody or uh, stop anybody. It's just a marker. Yep. Okay. Who's taking yeah, the pictures? Go ahead and ask any questions. Pardon? No, you have a question here. Yeah. Did you take the photographs that you're showing today? No. You did. It's, uh, you can see where I am up here, and I'm the only pilot in the aircraft, so I have to keep all the hands on the aircraft. So. I'd rely on one of my buddies. I'd give him a case of beer so I could get his photographs, but it worked out fine. <laughs> no, I didn't take these, and that's why I don't, there's no action shots of what Lotzes actually do because you're kind of busy at the time. I well, wanted to know who took the picture, so. Who took the picture, the okay. <laughs> I had a question. Is so, like in, uh, Fighter pilots and stuff like that, they have onboard cameras that show the, you know, the rounds going out and the targets being hit and stuff like that. You guys didn't have any of that stuff on the loaches or even the Huey pilots. Did you guys have any, you know, cockpit recorders? That no, you, yeah. no. You saw the instrumentation. We thought that, we thought yeah. that was pretty good yeah. that we were getting that, so. <laughs> More weight anyway, right? Well... Uh, at that time, the uh, American news media was covering us pretty well, so I think we had the had the inclination that we didn't need more coverage. So, 
this right here this right here is what happens when you get too low and too slow and that's a burning loach right there a burning loach so uh, it doesn't look like that there's a way to get them out but it, it could be it, burning that much would probably burn somebody to death I got a, that would be survivable how often does that happen? Um, we were the our platoon in the A company, A troop. Uh, we would go through full rotation. It means replace everybody about once every six months. And there were there were about we tried to keep six pilots, two in reserve, and then four flying every day. And um, we would make contact anywhere from two to three times a week, contact being actual shots fired, fired back at us. Um, normally we could get out of it. The, uh, the techniques, well you see what a broken loach looks like, so we don't need to look at that. Oh, <laughs> here's what our grunts did during the day. If, if they stayed back at base camp, then the first sergeant would put them to work painting, scrubbing, uh, doing yeah. KP, you know, yeah. so, but out here you can kind of see that things are, and this is the pilot right here. You can kind of see they're a little bit more relaxed. Um, some of our crew chiefs were very proud of the uh, combatants that we dispatched with and they would put little stencils up there. Uh, it, uh, this one was pretty decorated. Usually you don't get that far before somebody gets you. The loads that I showed you burning, the slicks, the only way they had to get them out was to drop a ladder down. And the pilot up here has to focus out because you can't, you have to be stopped. You can't go up and down, you can't go left or right or back and forth. Because when you drag guys through trees, when they get back to base, they have some words to talk to you about. <laughs> so you had, you had to put a lot of control on that and they practice that quite frequently. Some of the other aircraft we used um, around the country, this is a caribou. We didn't have any of those in our units. This is an O2. The Air Force flew these and they were uh, forward fire directors. It was these guys that helped us a lot. Let's say that I was down in the trees and somebody was shooting at me and I decided it was more than 100. So I would leave. Drop the smoke. Our CNC ship, which would be flying up about 3,500 feet all the time, would call one of these guys and we would get, get jet support from one of the coastal areas where they, they had the jets. Jets could be on station in uh, about 8 to 12 minutes. So we were very happy to have these guys and he carried rockets also. He fired additional smoke because by the time they got there, they were gone. So we would back off, the jets would do their thing, and we'd go back in and take a look and see what, what damage they did. We also reported on how many kills they got. We usually overestimated those by about 100%. The reason was, you know, I said that eight to 15 minutes, the other troops that wanted jet support got jet support an hour later. So it was up to us to make sure the jets were doing their job and uh, we recognized that. And they liked that and that was their, that, that's when they got their little stencils on the side of their aircraft. Uh, one of the uh, workhorses, a C-130, 
And then I believe that's a, a 141? 140? Yeah. And this was down, I was, uh, I was getting, getting to go on R&R here. And uh, I believe that this is out of uh, Saigon. Sometimes when you're in the middle of battle, you need to be reminded why you want to go home. So this was a good way to remind the guys that you don't want to stay there. There's stuff at home that you want to go see. Where we slept were hooches that uh, were sandbagged. And we slept two men to a room. This was the officer's quarters. And I had to sleep with a gun pilot. He smelled bad, but I still stood up with him. Uh, the reason for that was our engagement over the target, we had to know what the other guy was thinking. So the gunships and the loach pilots slept together, ate chow together, and generally got familiar with the others. Oh, idiosyncrasies would be a good word. This is wash day. You wondered how we kept our clothes clean. We hired indigenous people to come in and uh, wash our clothes, which needed it every day. And I tell you, it's, for the money we paid them, it was well worth the, the uh, work that we got. And here we got our boots polished, so we looked like officers. Oh, this is the officer's latrine right here. Yeah. Yeah. And these barrels are filled with about half full of JP4 jet fuel, which is kind of a diesel-like fuel, has oil in it. And then they would be slid underneath the uh, doors here, which would open up. And officers use them during the evening and morning before we took off. In the middle of the day, then that would be disposed of the leftovers right there. So all I know is you never wanted to walk through that smoke. See the smoke right here? <laughs> Just, we didn't want to do it. Thanks to people back home, we got to celebrate Christmas. Don't ask me where you get a pine tree in the middle of a jungle, but you do. And then uh, we had, we built all this stuff out of the, those rockets you shot being fired. They came in wooden boxes, so we'd take those apart. This is a bar right here. I don't know that it ever got used though, <laughs> except every night. <laughs> and I had, uh, my sister sent me uh, the poster here just to remind me that I was bulletproof. Every once in a while, we would get a nice sunset and just remember how things were. And I, I thought this was particularly pretty. We were changing areas of operation and we were coming from this direction and ended up over there. but. This village right here, this is their open air market. Normally I would be up about 3,500 feet, but the distance was too short. And uh, the reason I was looking this way was we would very often get gunfire from these hooches. So it was, it was not a good situation to stay in very long. Here we were going home, and I took this picture. Uh, the areas that we worked like this, uh, we would get a military grid takeout, and we would fly in a pattern to cover everything, looking for the bunkers, usage, uh, pack animals. We ran into some of those elephants sometimes. Um, we would, uh, to work the area, we would be, where I like to be was my rotor blades were slightly below the treetops because that gave me the best shot for if I heard fire, 
to move. So you had to know where all the treetops were because if you hit a tree, you were going down. So he stayed in the treetops for cover and had to move in and out. Uh, we would, uh, our observers <clears throat> would help us go back and, and find what we were looking for intelligence wise. But during the playtime, oh, we didn't have pad time. During the return to the uh, POL point to get refueled, they had a bunch, there was usually some birds and some monkeys in the trees. And I would use the birds for tactical practice on handling the helicopter in and out. And the observers would use the monkeys for practice, which I thought was very good because it was a smaller target. And I wanted them to be accurate when they were shooting at something. So I think that's it. So I can open up for questions. I can. Yes, sir. Most of your time then when you were flying the Loach uh, was around your base camp was Campanari? No. We, uh, <coughs> Campanari was just south to play coup, and we would fly up over here. Doc Ho had a refueling base. And we would work the tri-border area uh, sometimes as far as uh, duck. I can't remember. Can you stand on the other side of your picture and um, move those chairs? Because we can't see on this side. We can't see what you're talking about. Thank you. OK. Base was down here, Campanari, out of Docto, and then we worked the tri-border area. So, uh, about 50 kilometers. Yes? How many missions a week or a day or did you fly? How many, how many missions a day or week did you fly? Okay, like we operated 24-7. 24-7? And the routine you saw with the, the uh, loaches going out in formation happened seven days a week. With six pilots, um, there was a lot of times that I flew uh, over 140 hours in a month. Commercial pilots are grounded at 80 hours a month. But at 140, uh, the old man had to give you clearance to fly some more. So we were always short of pilots. So uh, we would fly usually two missions in the morning and two in the afternoon because we would replace the other uh, team that was out there. And how many, did you have one tour over there or multiple tours? No, I just had one tour in combat. Then I transferred down to Vung Tau and did uh, maintenance. And I was a test pilot down there after we got the rebuilding uh, helicopters that fly and really so. one northern duty assignment, was that 12 months or like how many? No, and uh, we were at, down here at Bambi to it. And we were down there while I was in the unit. They did, after I left, they did other stuff. And um, the Bambi to it was where um, we were uh, put in a, a uh, LERP camp, long range patrol. And we built our GP mediums and sandbagged them. And we flew out of there for probably about two months. So we slept on cots, had a tent. Um, we didn't have indigenous people helping us with their laundry or boots at that point. They, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't uh, come out there, so that's fine. And we found out that during the rainy season, you can't get your clothes to dry outside. So if you hang your foot through your fatigues on the uh, Constantina wire, it would, they would never get dry. So you would hang them up inside the tent, leave the tent flaps open, let them dry that way. Yes? So helicopters were only used for combat, is that right, in Vietnam? I'm just curious. Our first mission was dust off, which is recovery of wounded soldiers. Okay. So, and uh, some resupply, but if you saw, that was about the max weight with six people in there. 
So as far as hauling rockets and stuff like that, the smaller helicopters, the Huey, the Snakes didn't have any capability of hauling anything. And the only thing I hauled was ammo. So I have a question. So how many, you said you had a platoon, six people, is that right? We had officers and enlisted men. We had the scout platoon, the gun platoon, and the select platoon, which we call the reds, the whites, and okay. the blues. And in each one of those was a compliment. The, the enlisted people in the scout platoon were the observers, and there were hardly any enlisted people in the uh, gun platoon because they didn't they didn't, couldn't carry anybody except another pilot. And then the slicks had uh, the grunts, so. So I had one more. So where are these located in Vietnam? Like, and where would, were they operating? <clears throat> so where were they based and where were they operating each of these? We, with the air cab, our mission was reconnaissance. We all flew together. So when we went out in the morning, you saw the picture of the four loaches. There'd be four Cobras behind that and four slicks behind that. We would all go to Docto and land, get our mission assignment, and then two loaches, two snakes would take off to the area. But that's just for that one area, isn't, aren't there others in other areas? Well, there's other, we were the 7th and 17th, and there was, what was that first cab unit down there? First cab, first air cab. No. What was, what was your de your troop at an RA? Uh, D troop first and tenth cab. Yeah, and they worked in a different area, so there was multiple units of this. Um, they flew out of one part of the um, camp in RA, and we flew out of another part. Um, the uh, there were. These numbers are approximate because I looked in a couple of different places to get a couple of little different numbers, but there were 1,419 LOHs manufactured and sold to the U.S. Army, and they came out of the Hughes Aircraft Plant. Uh, 1,800, I'm sorry, 842 of those were stayed in Vietnam. Uh, that's about 60% down rate. Cobras, on the other hand, there were 1,100 made, and they lost 300, and that's about 27%. So we were in a little bit higher category than the Cobras. Oh, we have a question here. Okay. I have, yeah. I have a few questions. Thank you very much for my freedom. Um, I wanted to ask you some simple questions. The hooch that the hooch, you know, fire onto those hooches. Is that typical? of what most of the villages or what most of the living um, units are in Vietnam at that time? Uh, is that, yes, yes, uh -huh, that. Does that represent what a village usually looks like in Vietnam? Uh, yes, for the uh, Vietnamese. There is a subgroup there, the indigenous people, called Mountain Yards, and they're their buildings were usually built on stilts and out of bamboo with thatched roofs. Okay, and you said that you um, uh, tried to miss the trees. So what kind of trees were there and about how tall, I mean, you know, just uh, were they deciduous trees? Go back, they weren't... yeah, go back one slide. So, okay. so those trees, is, that's pretty much typical of what the trees are in Vietnam? Yes, the only place where it was different was along the um, uh, the the border, and then they would have sprayed Agent Orange on those trees and defoliated. And what, how tall were they? Okay. So you're flying that how low? We did, a lot of time. When we were flying and when I describe stuff back, I describe it as single canopy, 50 feet, double canopy, 100 feet, triple canopy, 150 feet. Okay. And that gets more up in your highlands area where it's damper. How well can you see through that? You I mean, can. when those trees are that thick, they're really thick trees, right? Now you know why I was down where I was. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, do you, how long did you stay flying helicopters after you left the service? Uh, I didn't. Um, there were more helicopter pilots in town, and I would have been paid less to fly helicopters 
for a civilian outfit than I was making in the Army. And I didn't want to go back to the Army. So okay. I went back to school. And how, how much, um, I, I don't know how to quite say this, but, but the Vietnamese, how helpful were they or how supportive were they in the contact that you had with them of our being there? Meaning, I totally support the, the war we did. I'm just saying, I'm wondering what kind of what kind of relations or what kind of atmosphere were you operating in when you're trying to save their country? The pictures that I showed of the laundry and shoes being done yeah. was generally the only contact we had with Vietnamese inside the camp. And that occurred during the day, which normally I would not be there. So that's why I took the pictures, because I thought it was pretty unusual. But um, the support that we had, I hated to go into town. Because? Because the thing that I was scared of was eight-year-olds. You'd have, um, and anybody who's been there knows what I'm talking about, they would hand an eight-year-old, and they would come up to us, because a lot of guys gave them candy, and they would have a grenade with a pin pulled. And they were told by the guy that gave them the grenade to hand it to the GI over there and so an eight-year-old can hand you a live grenade. It just scared me to death. I, did, I didn't go to town in the play coup unless I absolutely had to. And what did you go there for? Uh, usually it was pick up uh, supplies. And supplies were food and... Uh, building supplies, replacement screening and stuff like that. And the eight-year-old didn't know they were going to be blown up, too. No, they did not. Yes, Jesus. And the people that would talk to you would be dressed in the darker colors and straw hats. The people that would not talk to you were the upper class that wore all white. And they just, uh, they, would, they would cross the street to go around you. But that's based on very limited experience. Well, but you were there in 68, right? Yes, 68 and most of 69. You were there until 75, or what, what time? Actually, 73. Well, there were other people that placed me. I, uh, I know some of the guys that came in that actually were in a group at 717th that uh, came in about a month before I left, but he was driving slick, so Chuck I didn't Robin, know him. Chuck Robinson back. Chuck, raise your hand. Chuck had two assignments there, first time flying medevacs and second time flying Cobras. And then he spent, what, 30 years afterwards still flying helicopters. More than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's got quite some stories. Can you tell us what you ate in various places? How did you get meals? We would make reservations at the restaurant. <laughs> We had a mess hall, and it was just for our company, A Troop. And generally, the milk was powdered. If I, pardon? The eggs were powdered. The, uh, if I never see a canned roast beef again, it will be too soon. We had that a lot. Uh, I absolutely hate liver. And one day they tried to serve us liver, and it was so bad, I just turned and left. I couldn't eat it. So uh, we had a mess hall. Uh, usually I'd get a cup of coffee in the morning, and then we would have um, uh, sea rations, which were made for World War II. So this is 68, and that's, you know, 15 years later, well, 20 years later. And uh, so what, well, pardon? Probably, you can probably open a can of those things. I, I don't think I've lost the technique, but we had, we had little can opers that had a little uh, knife on them. And what was fun about those, when we were sitting there waiting to be refueled and go back out, we'd open them up and get ready for lunch. And about the time that we would have all the cans open, yeah. here would come a helicopter blowing 70 mile an hour winds and all the dirt and grit would cover everything you had open. So, you just, and you got a few pieces, but they went out there, it wasn't a big deal. 
Could you eat as many as you wanted of those of those rations? Do what? Could you eat as many as you wanted, or were you just having a few pieces of rolling off the thumb? One is all you wanted, <laughs> and you didn't you didn't eat all that. There was a fight when they opened up the case. There were certain things in there that were very good. And some of them were not edible. So you had to fight to get to the case first to pull your sea ration out. And then it, if guys got there late, then they, they got what was left. Well, as long as you could heat them, they were quite edible. You know, and there were some that if they're cold, yeah, you could tolerate. But yeah. each, each box had, you know, like we had the roll. course. Uh, yeah, you had a small can which might have a roll or something. There would be some fruit uh, and, and maybe something for dessert. Could you and eat the scrambled eggs? Include cigarettes and all that, but that was out. Uh, Canned so. pizzas were always the hottest. Yeah, yeah. 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 they pizzas. were good. Bill? Bill, some of us have heard your pig story. That was just rather humorous. Can you fit that in, please? <laughs> a pig story. Yeah. Has anybody here heard a pig story other than mine? Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, we were on call to uh, support a general coming into a fire base. Two-star general. We were. Our job was to sweep the area on the flight path in. He was coming in on a Huey. So we got there a little bit early and we started sweeping around. And as we were clearing the area, I caught a combatant in my eye. He was about 1,200 pounds, he was about six feet long, and really short, four legs. <laughs> so knowing how we, everybody was absolutely tired of the stuff in the mess hall. Fresh pork sounded pretty good. So we, we uh, got the uh, pork to uh, start to incubate there a little bit in the hot weather. Sent my observer out to drag him in, put him in the back part of the loads there. And he goes over there and he kind of, and he looks at me and I go. So I was trying to make a decision. The decision I made was that I would friction down all the controls. If something would have happened to the aircraft in that configuration, I'd have been court-martialed and had to pay for it. <coughs> so you just never did that. So anyway, got out of the aircraft, unhooked from the, the uh, radios, and both of us dragged that pig about 50 feet. And when animals are freshly killed, you know, they're very loose and hard to handle. So he had to get in, and I pushed, he pulled, and we got him where the front legs and back legs were hanging outside the aircraft. <laughs> so we got back in, and by that time, my wing was right around me just to make sure no funny business was going on. So I told everybody I was ready to come out, and the, the open area was very small, and 400 pounds in a 2,700 pound aircraft makes a lot of difference. So I, I might have exceeded my turbine outlet temperature a little bit going out of there, pulling power. But anyway, I got out, came around, and the CNC ship let me know that the general was on final, final approach in. So I whipped around, and my job was to escort him in and act as a barrier between <laughs> him and side. So I was thinking, well, my career as an aviator is just about over. And I looked over, and there's the general sitting back of the uh, Huey. And he was, he was like this, like he's really thinking about it or something. I said, oh, God, I hope you don't figure it out. <laughs> but he put his hands down, and he looked over at me. And he looked over at me again. And then he just turned and went back to his <laughs> So it was straight, straight back to the base camp where our mess hall was. We had the flight surgeon come over. And he blessed it, saying it was okay to eat. And the cooks went to work on him, and 
we had fresh barbecued pork that night for dinner. Right. Everybody was very happy with that. So that's that's my uh, pig story. <laughs> Something about your career in the Navy being over. Were, were you in the Navy? No, I was not. I was oh. never in the Navy. Oh, I see what you're saying. You, you were in the Navy. As an aviator. Yeah, as an aviator. Yeah. Aviator, yeah. Yes, sir. I've heard that Hueys are very durable, <coughs> they take an off line of fire and still get back. How's the lotion? How durable is that? <coughs> if they shoot your engine out, uh, you go down. Um, the two, one time I they took my engine out, and I went through triple canopy jungle. Knocked out for a half an hour. We were um, supporting a fire base as being overrun, and that's why we were called in. My job is to go in, separate the friendlies from the enemy. The trip through the triple canopy jungle. The last thing I remember is starting to settle in. If you had any forward airspeed, you'd rip open the fuel tanks on the bottom. They would hit that turbine engine and uh, nobody could get you out. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to cut, come straight down. Apparently I was able to do that because when I woke up, I was up in the inside the perimeter of the artillery unit and I was laying next to a log and I hear somebody saying, you know, I don't think he's going to make it either. And about that point, I finally woke up and recovered. And he was looking at me. I, I had some blood on me, and uh, he didn't think I was. Of course, when you're out, you're all limp and everything. So, so to answer your question, I thought it was very durable in that occasion. The two other occasions, they actually shot holes in my rotor blades. It has four blades. And the vibration got so bad. Uh, on one of them, I lost about eight inches of the tip. I got on the ground. The guys came in, picked me up, and uh, we went on. They sent maintenance aircraft out. Same thing happened the other one, but I got shot closer to the uh, hub, and it stayed on. But the vibration was still bad enough that. I didn't want to fly it. I was afraid that whole blade was going to come off, and I didn't think it was going to fly very well on three blades. So. I expect you'd heard that rumor from somebody. Well, um, it's a very simple design. The hub and everything, there's no grease shirts anywhere on that aircraft. You have oil in the transmission and in the tail rotor transmission, and everything else is put in with bolts. Um, the aluminum airframe actually comes under here and it's kind of an A-frame that goes around the windows here. Yeah, and if I drop this, you'll yeah. kill me. Don't drop it. <laughs> the frame comes from here, down to here, around here, and then this back here comes up and goes up here. So that's the frame. The engine sits back here. Pilot observer sit up here and that's where the ammo is carrying. So from my point of view, well, I took more bullets through the front plexiglass of glass and through the sides that didn't hit the engine. And it was fine to fly. I would get cursed out by my crew chief because I'd come in and I was all shot up. He knew he had to stay up all night to fix it <laughs> so it could be taken out the next day. But um, Crew chiefs are somebody that you, uh, when you get back, you hug them because without them, you wouldn't have had a safe flight. And the other thing is, the reason that you develop such an affinity for the other guys is because your life depends on them. Likewise, them with you. So it's a reciprocal relationship. They, it doesn't matter what job you had. You know, you can be sitting there in the latrine and you got a roll of toilet paper in your hand and you think to yourself, how did that get here? Why do I have that? 
and you start to appreciate all the other guys who were doing jobs that weren't combat. But I'll tell you, it was awfully nice to have toilet paper. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Um, in the three times you went down, number one, I think we're all grateful you're here. Number two, did a uh, repair group come in and repair the helicopter at the spot it came down? Or did they, what did they do with it? Yeah. Um, actually, the Hueys stripped down and half a load of fuel come out and sling it out. So they would, uh, they would come down, drop the sling, and generally, uh, <clears throat> depending on how hot the area was, because they took out a couple loaches with them, then they could hook onto the mast and uh, just bring it home. And sometimes if it shot bad enough, um, we just left it there. Did your partner go blow it up? Yeah, we blew it up, yeah. We didn't want anything left there. And that magnesium aluminum alloy in there burns very nice, about like your sparklers on your uh, Fourth of July <laughs> celebration. Yeah. That scenario that you just described a few moments ago about getting shot, John? Yes. Is that how you earned your Purple Heart? Yes. No, well, I got a Purple Heart for that, yes. Okay. That's where I earned my distinguished flying cross was going back in and separating the the friendlies from the enemies, so that the other guys could go in. Absolutely. Well, you were pretty decorated when you got out of the military. I was, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time, <laughs> a lot of times. And lived. And lived, lived to talk about it, yeah. No, on, after that, when they, uh, I was in the hospital for about eight days, uh, concussion and um, underneath my chin here, and uh, they just wanted to make sure that they could put me right back into duty because <laughs> we were always short of pilots. So that was, uh, that was an experience itself, being in a field hospital. Uh, you look around and you look around at the other guys and you wonder why you're there because you're not hurt that bad. You can walk. You know, you, you can get up to go pee. I mean, there's a lot of things Very that you can way. do. And when you're... You're there, you're feeling bad because you know you're taking up space for somebody else. So the sooner I got out of there, the better I liked it. And I was flying two days later after I got out. So right back to the same thing. When you got out of the military, did you get out as a, a warrant officer too? Is that right? Uh, yes, I got out as a CWO, CW2, Chief Warrant Officer 2. Uh, I got assigned to the individual ready reserve. So basically I would call in and uh, see if I could uh, pick up some rides, have space for me at uh, one of the retraining centers. And I did that until 1989. And then uh, I decided I just didn't want to do it anymore. So they were kind enough to retire me as a CW3. Three. Three, and uh, I retired honorably. Bill, did, did, did you take a picture of the pig? <laughs> there wasn't enough left of him when I got back. <laughs> That's honestly not true. But we have our uh, cooking utensils were 55 gallon drums that we cut, put a rack over and filled with charcoal. And uh, he took up that whole two 55 gallon drums. <laughs> Yes. You said that you flew four missions a day, right? You, you went out four times, twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon? Yes. Okay, so, so then how many days at a stretch would you fly and for how many months? Or did you just, like, were you flying a third of the time, a half the time? I mean, you know, when you were there, when you were in Nam of that year. I was flying probably... 90% of the time. The, uh, like, <clears throat> um, the flight surgeon had to clear me three times. The, at 140 hours, you had to be cleared by the company commander to continue flying. And if you added on, it's every day they'd lop that day off and add another day. So it was a, a rotating time. 
if you flew eight hours and they took eight hours off and added what you flew the next day. And that cumulative total was either 140 hours. And then when you hit the 160 hours, you had to go to the flight surgeon and get a, a physical, essentially, to fly. So, so weren't you a little tired a lot of times when you were flying or taking off or landing? I mean, flying that much, I think you get exhausted consistently every day. You, uh, you burn up a lot of adrenaline, that's number one. You're young. <laughs> Jimmy, you, did you see the picture of me when I was? Well, I'm sure everybody else wants to see it again, too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Make sure you check your warning status. Yeah. There. See, that's what I looked like when I was flying, so. Okay, so, okay. But you still, you still, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, that's just still. So oh. Oh, I didn't tell you the other part. Uh, our war only ran from 7 to 5. So after 5 o'clock, we'd come on home. <laughs> we'd have chow. We'd go. We'd usually lie to each other about how brave we were that day. We, we'd, uh, we had, uh, I just had one roommate and... Had to get up and you had to be on the flight line by about 6.15 the next morning. So the officer's club closed down at, it was 9.30 or 10, I don't remember. But they would show a movie and it, was, it wasn't like the entertainment that I showed, but oh, you weren't here, were you? It wasn't like the entertainment that I showed before. But uh, it was just, you know, regular stuff. And were you saying that about a third of you didn't come home that were pilots or what? Um, uh, but what, what I didn't, what I didn't look up the number of pilots, but the uh, loads of pilots that stayed there were qu quite high. The death rate? Yeah. Thank you. I was proud to say I didn't lose myself or my wingman pilot or either of the two observers, so everybody came home. And you have a total number of flights that you I have, you get a, uh, what's called an air medal for every 25 hours of combat time. And I had, well, we quit counting, but I had over a thousand hours of combat. And that's flying out there, flying back. Not while I was eating lunch, I had to take that time off. <laughs> <laughs> and back with a... about how a pilot was selected back home and trained. Now, I noticed uh, you mentioned you did uh, your transition once you got in company, you know, in company. Right. But it must have given you a certain amount of training, and how did they select you to be a pilot? Uh, I thought I was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that got me a long ways. Yeah. No, uh, what happens... Uh, Everybody going into the military. They have recruiting stations, and ours happens to be downtown. And then they send you to an induction station. The induction station is where you get your first haircut, you get clothes, you get uh, a bunch of shots, and they give you a whole bunch of written examinations. Well, one of the tests they gave you is kind of a general IQ test. And they said, okay, you scored high enough on that, you could take the uh, Warrant Officer Candidate Flight Test or you could take the OCS, Officer Candidate Test. And I thought, I'm being an officer sounds like work. <laughs> so I thought being a Warrant Officer and flying would fit my personality. So I opted for that test. I scored high enough on it that I was placed directly into a unit that was uh, specially trained that went, you went from there straight to helicopter school. So did they choose me? Uh, by scores, I guess would be the best answer. And I didn't, I didn't act up bad. I, they put us in a, in, uh, 
basic training. We had a third draftees. Where, where, where did you go to basic training? Uh, I, I went in at Fort Leonard Wood, got my hair cut and everything, and I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then I was, uh, there was a bunch of National Guard in there. There's some bad stories about being in with the Louisiana National Guard. <laughs> Those guys talk about things that I cannot talk about in this room. Which led me to buy a lot of soap, because if I dropped it in the shower, I would not pick it up. <laughs> I slept with my... Cover stuck in because I didn't want anybody to sneak up on me in the middle of the night. <laughs> now, the guys who've been in know that that's all just funny games. But, uh, from there, I went, to, uh, I went to Fort Walters, Texas, and was put into a, a unit there where we did half day flying, half day schooling, learn how to be an officer. Anyway. <laughs> What to get rid of, what to stay out of. And then uh, the, that was for the primary training where you learn to fly, you learn basic aviation rules. Then I went to Fort, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Army Airfield, Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia. And I went through about four months of training there in tactics. And we flew Hueys all the time. So we had not flown any Hueys until uh, I got to uh, Hunter. So. That was a learning experience. He had to learn how to do crash maneuvers and all that stuff. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> no, go ahead. Okay, I just wondered how you like grew up and chose to go. I, I don't know. I'm assuming you chose, or maybe you didn't choose to go. I mean, you were drafted because there was a draft then. Uh, <clears throat> my. Uh, I got approved to go to Colorado School of Mines right out of high school. And after the first year, they decided that my academic standards and their academic standards were not the same. So, <laughs> so they said, why don't you go and get your stuff together and then you can come back and we'll talk to you. So at that time, I, I knew I was going to be drafted because I no longer had school. So I signed up, went down to the Army signed up to be in the Army Security Agency. That's why I was at Fort Leonard Wood. Army Security Agency, at that time, I had visions of Paris. James Bond. Of <laughs> Paris. Yeah. And it, that sounded awful exciting to me. And then I got there and started talking to some people about what that actually was, and I was going to be a typist with a security clearance. And I thought, Boy, that's just too close to the big guys. They were always jacking one of those little guys, so that's why I took the uh, warrant officer test. Okay. So that's uh, how I got chose, or how, right. So it was a convenient avenue to go. Scared the crap out of my parents. <laughs> my sister told me as I was leaving, if you get a tattoo, I'll kill you. So uh, I, it was big. My my sister always, also gave me that T-shirt that I was wearing there, and it was, <clears throat> the whole family was very supportive. So when I got back, that's one thing I I really had an advantage. When I got back, my family just fawned on me like I was fresh stew meat. I mean, it was just they couldn't get enough of me. I came back. I weighed 135 pounds. I'm 205 right now. <laughs> and every time I opened my mouth, my mom would. <laughs> <laughs> but that gave me, that couple of months gave me a couple of, gave me some time to get unwound. And that support continued on for many years. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm here, why I'm here, because it was available. The other thing that helped me, is that um, about 10 years ago, I had a guy stop by my house, and he says, you Bill Bates? I said, yeah. He said, do you fly helicopters in Vietnam? Yeah. 
right away, the hair on my back of my head started going up. And he said, we have a group of helicopter pilots and you might find it enjoyable to join us. Well, I went one time and put him off for about two years. Then I retired from work and okay, I went some more. The guy who did that for me is Rick. Rick, you want to stand up for a second? He's one of the other guys that helped me along. So my concern about joining the group was, God, I didn't want to go through that horseshit a second time. I just did not want to do that. So I went, and the first meeting was okay, and we didn't talk about shooting people or how bad the, the uh, quinine tablets were on Monday evening. So I started going more. And, and what I found out was really surprising to me that I felt normal in that group. Uh, you know, I see these guys with their hats on. I can go up and I can be talking to them here in 30 seconds. Where if you went up to one of those guys you didn't know him, he might say hello, he might not. But it got me to a place where I got a balance between where I was and where I wanted to be. So, and that's the whole reason why I can do this today, because I'm, I'm very comfortable with where I am, what I've done. And uh, one of the things I hope to accomplish today was give you guys a little military lingo to talk to your friends, your family members who have been in war and learn to talk to them because they will open up as soon as they figure out you're not trying to make fun of them, that you're not trying to chip on them for killing people. It's just, you know, it's, uh, it's very important to me to pass that message along. So I have a question. Um, I have a friend, good friend. You're next, go ahead. Yes. Um, I, I have a good friend whose son is 30 years old and he stays in his house. He went to Afghanistan. He stays in his house full time, doesn't want to leave to even get help. He's got PTSD. And I just was wondering what you would recommend. Why go to yourself a dinner invitation? To so go wangle a dinner invitation? Okay. See if you can Wait. get him to visit the museum. Yeah. And just, uh, you get a chance to talk to yeah. other veterans mm -hmm. right. who have done similar and we'll get you connected with Greg's group. And there's a lot of support there. Okay. But you're right, sometimes it's difficult to get that first step. Yeah. Ask him what unit he's in? Yeah, yeah, I know. I wrote that. You've already, uh, all right. Yeah. And then ask him what he does. Just say what, and if, and if he balks at that, then just say, what was your most fun thing you've done? And he'll have something. He may, may not be a pig, but he'll be close. <laughs> <laughs> and compliment him. You admire him for trying to do that. And then it's tough to come back, but you're here with him. Start there, and then just kind of work off that. If he gives you any feedback at all, just take the path that he leads you on. Also, the um, BA hospital has a PTSD department. There's plenty of things available. Mike knows more of them than I do, and uh, the guys around here know that stuff. So we're here to help. We're here to support our fellow brothers, brothers, and we would enjoy the chance to do so. Right. Yeah. Okay. In fact, Greg, yeah, I, I think I'd add to that that if you can find out what he did, yeah. chances are real good we can reach out and find somebody who did that. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. But we've done a fair amount of that, connecting people who did the same job, because then they really relate. Really, so. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, has he went to the VA yet? Has not gone to the VA yet. Yeah, they've got several things here in uh, Boulder mm -hmm. and all around to help him. And also, if he goes to Kim Hutchison, the gentleman's going to be here the 19th, 
We'll put it into the government and have a pretty good check out of the experience. Thank you very much. Ellen. But quite often, you, I find, it, you really need to connect informally with another veteran of kind of your same era. That's what I'm thinking. To too, just though. talk. Because personally, uh, and others I've known, to you know, get into the VA system that's a much more formalized structure, and sometimes you just need to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. So, Bill, well, thank you so much <coughs> for starting this day. Hey, Dave. Do you want me to take this off? Oh, I finally hit one, huh? The only thing I was just going to add is I was with the 25th Infantry Division and we worked very closely with a group like, you know, Bill's because the lunches would be flying out there over the dense jungle. That was the entertainment I was talking about. Sorry about that. <laughs> but they'd fly over the dense jungle and we'd be looking for logistics bases or regimental headquarters for North Vietnamese and stuff. We'd flip one more or a couple more. <coughs> And it's the loaches which would kind of find them because they'd be shot at. And then, typically, along with the loaches, the cobras would be there. You'd shoot it up. If it looked like it really was a big base or something, then you often would bring in the Air Force to bomb it. Mm. But then, if it looked like you really needed to get in there and find out what's going on, we'd be called in, whereas combat engineers. Mm. And they would fly a C-130 over the target area, drop a 15,000 pound bomb into that jungle. It would create a hole in it. <clears throat> and then we would go in with the first helicopter or two with infantry and then engineers with demolitions and chainsaws and stuff to expand the LZ. And as soon as we expanded a little bit, you'd run around with demolitions and blow up everything you could find. Uh, and then eventually, you know, more infantry would come in and you explore that whole area. <coughs> but again, you're working all together with all, yeah. all three elements of that, and not to mention the Air Force and stuff. <coughs> well, we would even call in artillery sometimes, too. Yeah. So, it was a group effort. Yeah. <coughs> so anyway, thank you very much for joining us today. and. Uh, Please come for Tim Hutchinson and our other speakers.